if the science is not valid, it is not an ethical study. Lord of the flies. Cut their wrists while they were at the camp. I'm fighting for my life here. People get crazy. Who's watching my child? Grab my ass and my boob. Get off of me, you're hurting me. Stop. Wow, the poor people in this study. June 2017, a summer camp was about to start, led by nutrition professor Dr. Connie Weaver. Camp Dash. Camp Dash. Camp Dash. Camp Dash. Camp Dash. The Dash Camp. Camp Dash. Camp Dash. Camp Dash. Dash stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. That's a typical thing, is to name your study something kind of cute and positive. Dash. Camp Dash was an experiment looking into the effects of salt on adolescent blood pressure and cholesterol. The camp had two 25-day sessions split by a five-day break. So there were about 70 participants who would be eating, playing, sleeping together in a residential hall on Purdue's campus. That's Purdue University in Indiana. There were other organizations involved, but the children would be staying at Purdue. This is Dr. Connie Weaver. She's a distinguished professor with a track record of running summer camps that are also experiments. Our data will set the guidelines for diet for adolescents for the future. Dr. Weaver was in, in charge of the whole project. She's a very passionate person that wants to improve the world. Dr. Connie Weaver, who just came off so sweet and so nice and so knowledgeable. Dr. Weaver was awarded a federal grant of more than $8 million to do the five-year study. You know, if you get a $500,000 grant, that's good. A million-dollar grant, that's really good. An $8 million grant is huge. It'd be a little bit of a disaster, you know, for a study to go so wrong that it had to be closed down. So what went wrong? In the U.S., academic institutions have a lot of power. They have a lot of power. Purdue has a brand that I feel like if this experience didn't tarnish it, it should. It should. Hypertension or high blood pressure increases the risk of life-threatening illnesses such as heart disease and stroke. Hypertension is just such a huge murderer in African-American community. And so the idea that now there's this study where they're actually looking at this in children to maybe prevent this down the road, this was like, oh, it's like a way of giving back. My son Dante was 13 years old when he went to Camp Dash. There were supposed to be 150 participants aged 11 to 15. They'd be split into groups and fed special diets. They wouldn't be allowed to eat anything else. The kids would have daily tests, monitoring things like blood pressure, saliva and urine. Getting people to stick to a diet and making sure they don't eat anything else is tricky. Dr Weaver had successfully run many feeding studies in the past, but Camp Dash was going to be bigger. The study was a paid study. $750 is what they were going to pay the kids. Dr. Weaver made a point, at least with the Cincinnati people, to stop and talk to all of the parents. She was so personable and so caring. He was getting ready to get away from home, and he was going to get to live in the dorms. And it, it was about having that college, being on a college campus. That, that was what was the most appealing to him. It was just like going off to summer camp. That's the best way to explain it. Good morning. Summer camps in the United States have been around for more than 100 years. Children participate in camps programs. That's what they do when summer comes around. In neighborhoods like we serve in Chicago, that's not an expectation. There's the barrier of financial concerns. The experience of camp can certainly be divided by class in the US. There's less opportunity for underserved children. The researchers needed a diverse group of kids. Inner city Chicago was one of the main areas they recruited from. I'm Lois Shepard, and I'm a professor at the University of Virginia, and research ethics is one of my areas of expertise. Everything I know about the study, basically I'm learning from the internal report. After the camp was shut down early, the university launched an investigation. Months later, they published their findings. The study was shut down because it had a lot of concern about the safety and welfare of the participants. 
During the five weeks that Camp Dash was in session, there were dozens of incidents of violence, claims of weapon possession, sexual assault, sexual harassment, intimidating behavior, bullying. The report says that the camp's design was inadequate when it came to providing a safe environment for the children. One of the first things people noticed when they got to camp was how hot it was. A non-air-conditioned residence hall was selected to house the participants during the 2017 summer. This resulted in a savings of $25,000. I noticed it, but my thought went to, well, they've got fans, so they'll be okay. It just seems like data was more important than anything. We're going to save some money. We're going to cut corners. Some parents worried that the heat might affect the children's mood. Heat affects you. Heat drives violence. In law enforcement, when, when you realize it's going to be a hot summer, you're like, oh, because people get crazy. Later, Purdue's own report would reveal that the budget was fixed about five years before the camp actually started. Money was tight. But rewinding back to June 2017, only 78 kids actually showed up on the first day. They were settling into their dorms when the incident started. In the first week, two children were arrested and thrown out. One child went to hospital after a violent incident. The following days weren't much better. There were huge gaps, the report found, in the supervision of the children. My name is Trisha. I'm a truck driver. My hours are not the funniest hours. It's from 2 a.m. It sometimes takes 14 hours. I'm 12 years old. Kyuki has ADHD. It's kind of confusing sometimes. Can't really stay still. Sometimes I take my meds. Sometimes it makes me kind of nervous and a little bit, you know, it's kind jittery. of jittery. Yeah, jittery. I gave Camp Dash the medicine. They were aware that he had to have medicine and had to have constant supervision. There was a situation happened where um, there was this big kid. He had to grab my roommate. He took him by his neck and he slammed him against the wall. And then when the big kid saw me, he said, give me your keys, I'll crush his neck. And I was like, I didn't know if he would do the same thing to me or if he would really hurt him. There was like three rooms. I saw them during the incident. I ran over there because I didn't want to get hurt. It, it was scary. And I, I don't like to really talk about that sometimes. I received a phone call. I was getting ready for work, so this is very late at night. I missed the phone call, so I tried to get the voicemail. What I heard was, get off of me, you're hurting me. Stop, you're hurting me. I never heard his voice in a panic like that. I tried to call the counselors, no answer. I received a phone call from the police, and he said he was fine. It's just the roommate got into some trouble. I didn't get any response from any counselors until the following day. I wanted to know why was he doing out of bed that late? Why I couldn't reach a counselor? What's really going on over there? Who's watching my child? The representation had been made that the ratio of counselors to participants would be one to four or one to five. It was not anywhere close to that. At certain times at night, it was 1 to 26. There were areas on campus that proved hard to supervise. The children quickly worked out that they could move around campus without getting caught. One of the more isolated areas was the laundry room. And there's this one particular troubling incident which had to do with some sexual harassment of a male participant against some female participants. I was 15 years old when I went to Camp Dash. One of the kids came in when everyone else was gone and I asked him if he needed help with laundry. Well, he grabbed my ass and my boob and said he likes older women. And when I pushed him off, he just said, you're just playing hard to get. How did that make you feel? Very uncomfortable. First, I spoke to one random boy counselor and he just said, boys will be boys and walked away. Said I needed to lighten up. Several other girls complained that they had been sexually assaulted by the same boy. A head counsellor told Dr Weaver on June 20th, and the boy was thrown out the very next day. But Penelope still didn't feel she'd been supported. Dr Connie Weaver's reaction, it made me feel it was as if I was being interviewed for, like, some a crime I didn't do. The incidents weren't reported to anyone outside of the study at the time. The police weren't told until a month later. There was a $200 activity fee for camp. The kids thought that they'd be doing sports, nutrition classes and field trips. But the reality was different. I was 15 when I went to Camp Dash. Uh, I was 12 when I went to Camp Dash. 
I expected it to be a great experience for both of the girls. What we thought was going to be the structured daily activities, then what we found out was there was a lot of downtime where they were doing nothing. My personal opinion, that was the downfall of the camp. Because of their age, they needed to have something constantly a schedule for what they were supposed to do. There was nothing else planned besides the time to go for their testing. The children had hours of downtime with nothing scheduled. The investigation would find that this was making supervision difficult, especially in the evenings. But this wasn't the only challenge. The children were recruited from rural Indiana and Cincinnati, Ohio, and the inner city of Chicago. In order to qualify, they had to be in the top third for certain high blood pressure measurements. And so it was anticipated, according to the report, that these children would come from lower socioeconomic circumstances. I had an opportunity to sit and talk to other parents. It turns out a lot of people that were there were low income, and if they weren't low income from Chicago or Gary, they were low income from rural Indiana. So I think that might have been like the first time I was like, whoa, there's a lot of poor people in this study. I remember thinking like you're bringing in children from the south side of Chicago. I mean, it's a documented fact that you're gonna have a high rate of trauma coming out of those areas. The effect of trauma on the children in our neighborhoods is great. From a behavior standpoint, the children may have reactions to things that are quite surprising. Most of our population has been exposed to violence or shooting on some level. The relationship, the understanding of their background, the understanding of what possible trauma may have affected them is really important. The kids were from a variety of backgrounds and had a range of needs. But even Purdue's report says that staff weren't trained well enough to care for those who had more complex needs. There was another problem. Children were staying in the study despite abusive behavior. There was definitely pressure on Dr. Weaver to retain participants. And that's generally true of all research studies, though. You want to keep your numbers till the end. So I'm the balance person between enough data trying to correct the situation with who we have and nope, we just have to give it up. My husband and I were just doing grocery shopping on a Sunday and I got a call explaining that Dante had been burnt by a hot rock in the sauna. And literally my first thought was, oh my kid's so clumsy. You know, I just pictured him, I love the saunas, but I know that if you you know, fall on a rock and don't get up fast enough, it'll hurt. And so they said, well, we have the ambulance looking at him. And so I was like, oh my God, is it so bad that he needs to go to the hospital? And they're like, no, 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 no. They're just looking at it, it's fine. You know, it's not, there's a little blistering, but you know, it's not gonna be permanent or anything like that. And when he calls me, he says, no, somebody, this boy took a rock and pushed me down and held it against my back and he did it on purpose. And so I said, well, do we need, we're, we're gonna come and get you. And, no, 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 mom, it's fine because it's zero tolerance. They're gonna kick him out. I get a call a week later and Dante is so upset. Like, ma, this kid is still here and he has like punched so-and-so in the face. And, and I'm like, what? So you're meaning to tell me that they, there's a kid just going around like beating the snot out of other kids and they're just kind of like, oh, whatever. The whole thing just reminded me of Lord of the Flies, period. And I just, I just did not expect that to happen at Purdue University's campus. The investigation would later find that Dr. Weaver knew about the rock incident, but she didn't report it to administrators immediately. By the time they were nearing the end of the first session on June 30th, the chief of campus police warned that there was an imminent threat to the health and safety of the children. He recommended that camp was canceled and the kids sent home. So in the first session, you know, things are going poorly and the police are very involved. The university have said if another incident occurs before July 5th, we're shutting down. There will be no session two. There were definitely incentives to delay reporting or to not report if you wanted the camp to go forward. The university considered stopping the camp, but in the end, they pushed ahead with promises from researchers that things would change. In an attempt to fix things, Dr. Weaver held an emergency retraining day for counselors and staff in the five-day break. Good morning. If someone had told me that we would have had two camper arrests in the first three days of session one, I would have looked at them like they were from another planet. I wouldn't have believed what we had to deal with. We're not equipped to handle that level of 
problems, that level of trouble. Boy, didn't I figure that, <laughs> that out. We weren't equipped. Only conditionally are we allowed to go on because they think we're that much of a risk on campus. I'm fighting for my life here. The first time I ever knew Kai Weaver, she emailed me about the dash camp. In her email, she kind of explained a little bit about the camp and, and some of the concerns she had, problems they were having. She was very open about where she was at, very open about the fact that they were already being reviewed by the IRB. An IRB is an institutional review board, and that is an ethics review board that's established within the institution. And the main reason is to protect human subjects. I came to Purdue and it was the last day of the camp for the first session. Look at the counseling staff, which was, which was not as diverse as the kids they were working with. I realized that they were going to be having some struggles. Anytime there's altercation between kids, any of the adults can be concerned about their safety and about if they had the ability or skills to defuse it. That was a, a concern there because they saw these fights happening in the first session and it was like, I don't know what to do. You know, what am I supposed to do? One counselor quit her job at Camp Dash after being sexually harassed by a group of boys during a sleepover that Dr. Weaver had allowed. We spoke to several student counselors about their experiences, but no one wanted to go on camera. My goal was to train the staff to minimize you know, future problems. And one of the things was to bring in a professional camp manager, Dwayne Moffitt. I didn't even know such a person existed before a couple of weeks ago. I'm so grateful he could help us figure out how to do camp on a management scale. We're scientists trying to run this. There was a gap in the hierarchy between Connie Weaver, head of the study, and the head counselors. You'd normally expect to see in a camp, a camp manager. You need a camp manager with experience who can anticipate problems, who can make it successful. I mean, it's a profession. You know, people just don't come off the street and run a camp. Break could come to an end and the kids were back on campus. Duane tried to change things by implementing tougher discipline and restricting how freely they could move around campus. Second session, when they brought in like the new leader of the camp, he tried to help, but I mean, they weren't really afraid of him either. Other kids we've spoken to have said that things did get a bit better in the second session, but incidents kept happening including sexual harassment and violent assault. It just breaks my heart because it was all preventable. If they had had supervision and structure and trained mental health people there to redirect those kids into a, a more positive interaction with one another. One child was given help from Purdue's psychological services, but for most children, there wasn't the level of care that parents had been promised. Dr. Weaver told parents that there would be a registered nurse on camp staff. The investigation would reveal that this was not true. When the IRB and others in the university started asking questions because things were going awry, it was noted that she would continue to represent that there was a nurse on staff for the study and a staff member would always correct her, which to me is just inexplicable. Another problem was that it wasn't clear who was supposed to be distributing medications. I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder, bulimia, schizophrenia. I've had it for as long as I can remember. And the things I see like become bigger in a way, like shadowy figures I see just become full-blown manifestations of things and they just like kind of attack me. The only medication I was taking last summer was Safras for schizophrenia. It was weird because they had it in like this safe thing, but it wasn't protected at all. And all like the counselors seemed to know the code. I was supposed to be taking that medication every night and any time I had an episode. It did not happen like that. Like, even if I reminded the counselors, they wouldn't bring me my medicine. We just came back from lunch when I was having my episode. It just started out of the blue while we were in the recreational room. And I just started breaking down crying. And I think I yelled at one of the counselors. And they just looked at me and laughed like I was crazy. It made me feel like a freak, pretty much. There would be, like, incidents where, like, kids would go and they would, like, cut their wrists while they were at the camp. So you would see it and they would, like, wrap their wrists up, but at the same time it looked shady, but no one would address that situation. Do you think the counsellors knew what to do about that kind of thing? No. I feel like some of them had the right idea of how to handle it, but just they didn't know how to. They were kids, so they don't know how to, like, address that situation. If they had training, maybe they would have, like, a protocol to do, like, okay, they're hurting themselves, they need to, like, get help. The camp struggled on into the second session. Incidents kept happening, but there was still hope that the problems could be sorted out. Then came an event that changed everything. My name is Kevin King, 
and I, what I call a consumer safety lawyer. I represent a child as a result of this horrible incident that happened to her at Camp Dash. In the end of July, she calls her mother and she's in a panic. And she says, a video was taken of me while I was in the shower. She was going to take a shower and I guess she only brought a towel for her hair and she needed someone to go grab her another towel for her body so she could go to her room. And I went to go get it and the counselor told me I wasn't allowed in her room and she had to run to her room, grab the towel. But then there was this one girl, she videotaped it on Snapchat. It got sent to everyone on Snapchat. She was crying, she was telling people to delete it, and some people were laughing and not deleting it. I felt her life has been ruined because that video is out there, and if somehow someone posted it on a site, it just takes one Google search to find that. And yeah, she was a kid at the time. Taken out of context, it's just porn. On the evening of the 18th of July, a head counselor told Dr. Weaver about the video. In Indiana, state law says that an incident like this one must be reported immediately to the authorities. The police weren't told until the next morning. Again, the police chief said that the camp needed to be shut down. This time, the university agreed. In terms of the child involved in the filming, the police report referred to it as voyeurism. Voyeurism and then distributing it on the internet can be a serious offense. This child has been charged in the juvenile court. There is no public record that any adults um, have been criminally charged for failing to report these incidents. Do the girl knew, knew she was wrong, what she was doing? Yes. Did she know she was committing a major crime? I'm sure not. It happens. We become a society of blamers. We want to blame everybody for everything and not take responsibility for our own actions. In the day, those kids knew that what they were doing was wrong, knew that they were following, not following the rules. Now the adult's responsibility is to, ensure, to minimize the kids' opportunity for poor choices. I think that it could have been and it should have been handled differently because she didn't know what she was doing. She made a mistake and everyone makes mistakes. No one is trying to excuse the behavior of the violent children. But I am pointing to the fact that you went and, and took children from violent areas and then didn't supervise them or give them any structure. So, it, so why is, are these kids not bad apples? Because you, there was an ethical obligation to make sure that when you're taking responsibility for children, you're doing every and anything in your power to protect them. Three days after the nude video was posted, the remaining 46 children were finally sent home. But unknown to participants, they weren't the only people at camp posting sensitive material online. Videos found their way onto a public blog in the UK and onto social media. This footage was taken by students working in the lab. It shows children's faces, files with full names and ages, and some test results. The boy in one of the videos is Agena's son. I don't know, was this like somebody just wanting to demonstrate how easy it, it is to like walk into a lab and just show the world who these participants were. This is sad and this is infuriating. What was going on that somebody could just walk in and publicize that type of sensitive information? That is just insane to me. We've asked Purdue about this and they said, Upon learning about this, Dr. Weaver contacted the UK Students Institution and requested that the site be taken down immediately. These postings are a clear violation of ethical protocols. These individuals received training on ethical research before they were permitted to work in the camp. These violations have been reported. Something else happened after the shutdown that's still not understood. After the study was closed, Dr. Weaver brought back onto campus for testing four of the participants who had left. It's just hard to understand. You just wonder if she was making decisions in a panicked state or just wasn't thinking things through. I just, uh, I, I can't come up with a justification for that. At least one family is now suing Purdue and other collaborators. The wider concerns raised by this case are the incentives that are in place uh, to complete research even when things are going poorly, <laughs> to keep your numbers in, to completion of the study even when people should be taken out of a study. All of those incentives are strong because so much money is on the line and people's reputations and their promotion and tenure and their jobs. Um, and it's very hard to pull the plug. 
I don't think they were prepared for any of this stuff, which caused it to be a very dangerous situation for all. Because of the experience at Camp Dash, the bullying and the violence, that's why I've enrolled him in self-defense classes, mixed martial arts, and his confidence level has changed because now he does defend himself. It was like really a scary experience, so now I'm a little bit more alert about what people are capable of. No one went in there in the camp with any intentions to do anything harmful or do anything, put anyone at risk or embarrass Purdue, Purdue or embarrass the Weaver or embarrass, no, that was no one's intention. It didn't work out how I wanted it to work out, but we did our best while we had the kids there. The university has said that. In publicly releasing the report, the university acknowledged that mistakes were made regarding the camp's operation and outlined specific actions to ensure they will not happen in the future. In the meantime, Purdue has offered to all camp participants an array of support services, including access to a child psychologist, and it has been responsive to families who have made complaints regarding the conduct of Camp Dash. Dr. Weaver hasn't responded to our request for comment, but at the time the report was published, he did release a statement saying, I am deeply saddened by the instances that caused Camp Dash to end early. As the principal investigator, I accept responsibility for events that occurred at Camp Dash. The safety and security of research participants always comes first. The decision was also made that all the samples and data collected during Camp Dash would be disposed of. So I understand the results of the study have been destroyed. That was probably done because the results weren't going to be valid. There were so many problems with the science in this study. Half the research that they have was tainted. It wasn't true. The blood pressure cuffs, the kids were breaking them. They were taking them all. Kids weren't eating the food. They weren't following the rules. I feel like the research wouldn't have been helped anyway because it was all like messed up. Recently, some parents asked to see their signed consent forms. The forms were changed during the study. Lines were added and parents were asked to approve. Some parents have asked for their original forms but they've been told by Dr. Weaver that the university ordered everything to be thrown away. We asked Purdue about this, and they said that it did not authorize destruction of participant consent forms. The failure to retain consent forms is a violation of IRB policy and related regulations that can result in sanctions. The IRB is expected to look carefully at this matter. You're asking people to volunteer to be in a research study for the purpose of getting good scientific results. And if the science is not valid, It is not an ethical study. The fact that we're not going to get any results, it's not going to change diets in the future, means these kids went through this experience for nothing. 